spend probably two or three shows talking about your experiences oh, and thanks. your different things. But Beth, besides being a science teacher, photographer, naturalist, docent, uh, and we'll explain what all those are. One of my big, what I'm a big fan of yours is that you take train for photos. So uh, we always t- we talk about that. Um, and uh, I love your bird. I'm not big into birds, but I love your bird photos when I've come out and seen them. Uh, when you had when we had the opening of the Aravipa campus, the reopening, you had a great display up there. And I I have one photo like Beth. Beth's got like a thousand of them. I have one of a seagull that looks really good. The rest of them are birds like flying off because I scare them. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so. We're going to talk a lot and uh, with Beth today about the science program, about what her students have an opportunity to do. It's really fascinating. If you're a student interested in science, you need to take Beth's classes because she gets you out in the field, and that's really a great way to learn. And, Joe, uh, we know we've got a lot of calls today. If people want to call in, you're going to be manning the phones. I know your voice is a little rough today. Uh, let's give out the number. 480-745-1033. And that's uh, if you want to call in to ask some questions, and uh, Joe will take them for you. Uh, Beth, let's let's start a little bit about uh, CAC. How long have you been at CAC, and how did you arrive at CAC? That's a very good question. Um, I started January 2007, so I've been here almost six years. Uh, I came here from Montana, where I was a chief academic officer at a community college there. I got very tired of being with all the politics, being a chief academic officer, and I really missed students and being in the classroom. And I had heard very good things about Central Arizona College and the faculty there. And um, I interviewed on the phone. They called me about three hours later and said, we really want you to come down for an interview, but we need to tell you you're going to be, if you get the position, you'll be at the Aravipa campus, not the main campus. And I was elated about that because I grew up in a town of 350. And then I was a uh, junior high and high school teacher at a little school in Westby, Montana. I always like to pl- put a plug in for <laughs> Westby. Westby is the center of the universe. It's a town of 90. <laughs> it's on the border of North Dakota and Saskatchewan. <clears throat> wow. And we had 49 students in Is that a town of school. 90? A town of 90, yes. Wow, Westby. Wow, that is cool. Yeah. Westby. Westby, Montana, way in the northeastern corner. I thought Kalispell was small. No, oh, Kalispell's <laughs> a huge city. <laughs> <laughs> but I was the junior high and high school science teacher at the Westby schools, loved my students there, loved the, loved the people in Westby, and it had 49 students. So when I found out I was going to, if I got hired, I'd be at the little campus, I was all about that in a rural area. So they interviewed me a few weeks later. They called me and said I had the job, and in two weeks I packed up my house and moved and came down here. It's uh, funny. That's about the same time I started. Was was yeah, at that we time. Yeah, about the same, same time. This, I remember that. Yeah. And, uh, it's um. So talk about the Aravipa campus because we've had a lot of guests on from Signal Peak and Superstition Mountain and some of the centers, but Aravipa is really unique. One in its location, two in its climate. It is different than the valley over here because you are up in the mountains, and and you do serve students. It's a smaller population, but there's a big need out there. There is. Um, I'm very biased, and so for me, the uh, Aravipa campus is the best campus, and when I introduce myself at college functions, I always say I'm from the most beautiful campus. We're situated in um, the where the Aravipa Creek uh, comes down, and, co- and there's the confluence with the San Pedro River. It's roughly 2,100 feet, 2,200 feet elevation. We have the uh, Galero Mountains. And the pronunciation of that, is, I've heard five different ones, <laughs> so I just call it the Galeros. If someone knows better, let me know. We have several nature conservancy properties around. They're not open to the public, um, but I contacted them and have partnered with them, and we can talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes um, with my students. So for a biologist and a scientist, this is an incredibly wonderful place to have a campus. There's nothing else around. Um, There's some ranches, some farms. Um, but the population's pretty low. The whole area that the Aravipa campus serves, most of it used to be copper mines and surf copper mines. They pulled out. So um, uh, there's there's a big need out there for uh, people to get rejob training because there's a mine that's still open, the Ray Mine and the Smelter. In fact, some of my students work at the Smelter. So the Aravipa campus itself, I want to say, has roughly 150, 200 students. 
Um, I would say the majority of my students um, are uh, in their uh, mid-20s to mid-30s, have families, have kids. They don't have the luxury of being able to be out on the campus every day a week, and so they absolutely love the hybrid classes. In fact, yesterday they were talking with me about hybrid classes, which is where they meet with me one day a week and then the rest of the stuff is online. So the population out there, I think, is in my opinion, probably a, a little different than what you would find at Signal Peak or Apache Junction. And uh, I absolutely love my students. They're, they're, they're the reason that makes my job so wonderful. Probably from a sheer geographic standpoint, even though our VIPA in terms of population of students is smaller than the other ones, ge geographically the service area is probably the, one of the largest because of you're going probably have students up as far up as Globe and go all the way down toward Saddlebrook. Yes, that, yeah, I have students. I have even students come up from Tucson, uh, Catalina. In fact, I've started having some office hours at Saddlebrook to better serve those, those students, particularly my online students. Um, we have students from Superior all over, but there's a huge need for our campus to be out there. The staff out there is wonderful. The other professors are very student-centered. Um, we're small, but it's that I think is an advantage for the Air Viper campus, and I absolutely love the Air Viper campus. Let's talk a little bit about what you teach. I mean, you teach probably a myriad of science sciences, but the, the biology is your specialty, right? Um, biology and chemistry. Uh, my okay. background um, is um, toxicology, which is anything from ecology all the way to molecular, and this it's the study of how uh, toxins, poisons, and drugs affect uh, living things in the environment. So it can be anything from ecology all the way down. Um, at Aravipa, I teach biology, I teach uh, anatomy and physiology, I teach, well, I was teaching nutrition for a while, I got very, very busy with my science department stuff though and had to stop doing that. Um, I teach environmental science, I, I teach the basic chemistry. We try to get a basic physics course going out there, but people get scared. It's like, don't get scared, it's fun, <laughs> we're gonna do some fun stuff out there. And uh, I'm uh, working on a natural history course too for non-majors, so they have some other options other than just cell biology or human anatomy to take. Now, I, I, wanna, I want you to tell people about the science rooms because the science rooms are really wonderful places at Aravipa. They're, yeah. they're, they're, people don't realize that they're and probably with the new ones at the Superstition Mountain campus that were basically from scratch, you look at the science rooms, those were some of the state-of-the-art science rooms around. Yeah, we're extremely fortunate out there. We, and we just had a, a re renovation out at the Aravipa campus, which we're very grateful for. And the science lab seats about 20 students, which is perfect, uh, particularly, excuse me, in terms of safety, because um, you can, only, by law, you can only have, I think it's by <clears throat> law, I, for, I forget, I forget now since I'm not in administration anymore, but there are certain standards where you can only have so many students in a lab for safety reasons. Um, the, we have um, also, as I said, outdoor classroom. I can take my students right outside the lab, and in fact, we do. Uh, go right outside the lab for some of our anatomy classes. You might be outside with anatomy, but they were doing some uh, cardiovascular um, studies in their anatomy physiology lab, and they had to do some various forms of exercise and then measure heart rate, blood pressure, those kind of things. So if I'm teaching biology, I can take my kids outside and, oh, wow, there's a vermilion flycatcher. They're a red bird, and they are brilliant red, and they have these really spectacular um, flight patterns, particularly the males do when they're doing courtship. But the, they also catch flies, and when they do it, the, the maneuverability and agility of these birds is amazing. So for my biology classes, as I said, I partner with the Nature Conservancy, and I take my students to the Nature Conservancy, and they do things like water quality studies, bird surveys, plant surveys. Um, they work with pisometers, which uh, measure the depth of the water, because the San Pedro River is a, it's a huge migratory corridor for birds. And it's one of the um, <clears throat> few remaining uh, rivers in Arizona uh, that's undammed, although it was pointed out in one of my Audubon um, uh, sessions that I was at that there is a very tiny dam now down near St. David, but it's not like the Hoover Dam. <laughs> so there's, there's, and it's funny, we have the wildlife going on in the background. <laughs> yeah, I can hear that. That's <laughs> but, great. <laughs> but uh, but uh, in terms of the, is there always water in the San Pedro River? That is an excellent question. Every The third Saturday of June, uh, they have what they call the San Pedro wet dry mapping. If you Google it, you can find historic data, I think going back 10 or 12 years, on where water's flowing in the San Pedro and where it isn't. 
Uh, the property that the Nature Conservancy has since they've had it, more water has been running in the San Pedro in that region during this third week or third week in June. Uh, and as you take out various um, uh, activities that draw the water out, you see more and more water coming back into the San Pedro. And you can follow this, as I said, if you Google San Pedro wet dry mapping. Where we are and where my students are, um, it basically depends on the time of year if there's water in the San Pedro or not. There's usually water in Air Vipa Creek up, up where we go on the Nature Conservancy property. Um, but it, again, it depends on the rainfall and those kind of things. If so, you're driving, did I answer your question? Yeah, it, okay. he did because it's um, <clears throat> when you drive in Arizona, obviously you see a lot of dry river beds, right? And because of dams and and a lot of different, obviously a lot of different factors. You're in the desert. Right. When you drive along Highway 77, there right. you're coming up from like from Oracle, yes. and you're and you're coming up into the Aravipa campus, and you get up in some of the mountains. You look down over in the valley, and you see kind of this line of tall trees is that the san pedro yes the green trees <clears throat> the green, it's like yeah. and it's like desert and mountains and then you have this obviously there's a water source there yes. that feeds that and so that's why i asked the question is there water in it all the time <clears throat> there there isn't water in it all the time and that we can see and we we can measure it in different areas of the san pedro there's going to be more water or less water the trees usually that you see are the big cottonwoods it mm. puts a beautiful green patch through it uh south of benson is the Oh, shoot, San Pedro River Alliance, I believe it's called. And they, they have all sorts of good activities on the river and preserving the river. Mm -hmm. um, the, the San Pedro is really interesting in that it also runs north and actually meets the Gila River. Oh, it runs north. Right, it runs from Mexico to the Gila River. There's a great book out on the San Pedro River, and, of course, the author escapes me, but if anybody's interested, they can contact you, and I'm happy to give them the info, information about it. And you mentioned about Arizona not having water. We have lost since um, settlement in Arizona something like 90% of our repairing systems, repairing being water and river systems. Wow. So that's kind of scary. And so it's nice that the San Pedro is one of those areas that's more protected. It's uh, it, it's interesting because when you, when you when I've driven that route in up 77 and it's you kind of start down where 79 comes in where Saddlebrook and just north of Catalina right. and you have uh, the saguaros in the desert and then you kind of work your way up and you get into the mountains and you have this mix of mountains and sort of these mine remnants that they've built and then you have some valleys where you have this green lush that goes through so is the water system that sustains that if they don't have a lot of water in year-round is it underground that supports that's a real good question and I, I'm not a hydrologist so mm -hmm. I can't really super accurately answer your question but again like any river or valley system um, your, the snowfall and the rainfall is going to really contribute to how much water is in the river as well as the uses. If you have a lot of agriculture that draws out a lot of water or you have housing developments or those kind of things, and I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying that that does draw that's water the out. Impact. You know, yeah. that's an impact. Um, and so there is water. You can, as I said, these pisometers that the students use that the Nature Conservancy has set up and other groups do too, they tell you what the water level is, the water table underneath. So an underground river doesn't really flow like we think of on top of a river it's more percolating through the soil and stuff so most of the san pedro again if you google san pedro wet dry mapping um it's really starting to come back because there is such a big focus by nature conservancy and other groups and including the town of sierra vista which has a, a large number of birders and audubon people uh, who go there because it's a big spot for birding and hummingbirds in fact the san pedro is one of the hot spot bird places in the world it's funny you don't think of rivers flowing north although they do oh, in yeah. certain <laughs> spots and uh but it, it's a it's it's a beautiful area i mean it must be you, you know you talked about being able to go right outside uh the campus but even to be able to go down uh to the aravipa creek into these areas i mean you can see for somebody like you the appeal of having the access to this out really an outdoor classroom it it is an out and and i'm all for taking my students outside and not doing can labs. In fact, um, sometimes you have to do can labs, but um, if I have the choice to take them outside and, and do things, I will. Um, the other thing I found is that sometimes students are not, even though they live in this beautiful environment, they're not always as aware of what's going on. And at the end of my class, I always have them tell me, um, what kind of things did you learn or surprised you, or, or how, do you, how do you do things differently now? 
and I'll get comments like, well, I never thought about the water before. And so now I shut the faucet off when I'm brushing my teeth or, you know, I won't take a 15 minute shower. I'll take a five minute shower. And, and then they'll, they'll really start thinking about it because they're out there and, and really connecting with it. Some of the students who um, are on ranches do have that connection because they're, uh, but not always. Um, so it's wonderful to see them get into it and really like it. And cause so many students are, are like, Oh, science. Oh, I don't want to do some math science. Yuck. But, I've seen that if you can get students outside of all ages, it really um, sparks their interest. And we have a, a little elementary school in Mammoth, which is a STEM school, and there's a teacher there. Um, she would actually, even though she's not part of CAC, she, she, she's amazing. She's a graduate of CAC, so she might be cool to have mm -hmm. on here. Her name is Julie Formo, and she does all sorts of exciting science projects with her <clears> students. <throat> And uh, she teaches kindergarten, she teaches first grade, second grade. She teaches, she's taught all sorts of grades. And I've uh, done some collaborative work um, with her, although she does most of it. I just come in and, and help her with some things. And Marin Wilson, who is our anthropology and um, social sciences professor, ha uh, does activities with her, ch her kids, too, and takes them out. Like, they just did a tour of Romeo Ruins okay. with her kids. Where are they located at? The, uh, the 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 stem school is right in the middle of mammoth and where are the ruins located that she oh just... the romero ruins those are in catalina state park so they actually went down yeah. into catalina yeah. to us uh, to see to see the and they're open to the public it's a uh, old Ho -ho uh uh site <laughs> sorry <laughs> i wasn't very articulate for a minute but yeah it's it's an amazing um place the hardest problem i have is that sometimes classes don't fill out there and you can't run a class if it's you know too small and so i i i'm not out there as much as i want because most people want anatomy and physiology and understandably so to go into the health careers nursing rad tech that kind of a thing so i can appreciate that but um it's nice when i get a, a biology or chemistry or something to fill so we can we can go outside with the nature conservancy uh, you're listening to cc live on kqck tom d camillo joe carrero we're visiting with beth krieger professor of science at central arizona college and uh, Bet the, the the students that are taking the classes, the biologies, uh, the chemistries that you're teaching, what is their kind of interest? Where, what fields do they want to go into? Do they want to go teach? Do they want to go into uh, a medical field? Do they want to go into, you know, uh, a corporate setting where they're doing research? What, is it vary? In the last three semesters, um, I've only been teaching anatomy and physiology because as I, like, if we have a face-to-face -face science course out there, it just doesn't seem to fill because, as I said, a lot of students have a hard time uh, getting to campus or have the luxury of getting mm -hmm. to campus every day a week because they have child care issues, they have elder care issues, they have jobs. Um, I have a student this semester um, who worked full-time for the mine um, but managed to get to class, which was awesome. But um, so most, uh, I can only speak for my anatomy students that I've had over the last three semesters, and most of them are very interested in the health careers, nursing, uh, I have uh, kinesiology at ASU is now a real popular major, uh, rad tech, dental hygiene. I have a former student now who's trying to get into pharmacy school, and I, I'm sure she will. She's, so I just wrote a letter of recommendation for her. Um, my students out there are just, they're amazing. I just, I'm so happy to have my students out there. They're what make the job. They're just great. So, but I have had students that have been interested in going on and studying biology. There's just fewer of them. It, it, it's, it's not as quick of a track to a, to a job. And in this economy, that's understandable. Uh, and there's, le there's less people. So it's a, you yeah. know, it's not, I mean, all those you have, there's probably a small percentage, even at a big school. And when you have less, just a population, it's probably a little bit more of a challenge to find those that are interested or even make them aware that it's, inter that it's there. Yeah, yeah. That's a big thing. So, Joe, looks like you got some calls. Uh, yes. Uh, first one, Rory from Apache Junction said he was going to do MCC, but this changes things. Never heard of the hybrid classes. Can you tell me a little bit about what you have available where I can join a class, do it the hybrid way, and we can still go outdoors? Oh, good question. Um, if, uh, and the gentleman who called is Rory? Rory. Uh, Rory, if you're in Apache Junction, um, the closest campus to you is Superstition Mountain. And to be honest with you, I don't really think they do a lot outdoors. But uh, if you were to... He did say he didn't mind taking a drive to, yeah, if, to be able to go to a good school. Oh, fantastic. Um, we have, our Apache Junction campus is good. I'm in no way saying that the things there are not good. It's just a different focus. Uh, there's a lot of our health careers are based there. 
Um, but Rory, if you wanted to take a drive to our Aravipa campus, which is located halfway between Mammoth and Winkleman, um, that's our Aravipa campus of Central Arizona College. And we have, I, I'm, I'm the primary uh, science teacher there and I do take students outside to do research in my Bio 181, Bio 182. Uh, the chemistry class when I'm uh, teaching it, sometimes I take them outside and I'm trying to develop a natural history course which we hope to have uh, next fall, this coming fall. Um, so what, 10 months from now? Um, and that will definitely be almost always outside. Um, if you were interested in doing um, some kind of an introduction or uh, introduction, what's it called, an independent study or that kind of a thing um, and come down and do some stuff, you could always talk uh, with me too and, and I would be happy to explore that. I haven't done that with a student at this college, but I would certainly be happy to. If someone's excited about going outside and doing things um, and I can also try to hook you up with some uh, people in your area, but in terms of courses, uh, at the there are there are uh, field trips and stuff that other classes take. For example, Wayne Pryor at the um, Signal Peak campus uh, takes his geology students on a lot of field trips, and uh, uh, or I, I shouldn't say a lot, but I know he takes them on several. <laughs> and but I, I can't really speak so much to the other ones. I hope I've answered your question, and if not, you can just contact me by calling CAC and uh, Tom DiCamillo. Yeah, and the other thing you can do is go online, check us out at centralaz.edu. You can stop in at any of the campuses or center that are close to you and ask those questions and kind of, you know, see what you need and then they'll direct you. If you need something more along the lines of what the way uh, Beth teaches or that kind of program, you can go in that direction. If there's something at another location, you can take classes at different locations as you're working for. So I'd encourage you to stop by the campus if, if the one at Superstition Mountain Campus in Apache Junction is close to you. Stop in and make an appointment with an advisor and, and start there. And then you can also look up Dr. Beth Krieger uh, and give her a call. Um, the other thing, uh, Rory asked about hybrid classes, and I, I didn't address that, and I apologize. A hybrid class is a class that meets partly in a classroom and partly online, and that depends on the class, what the percentage is. Um, when I teach a hybrid, we do the lab face-to-face, -face, and then the lecture and all the other stuff is online. So typically a hybrid class is a combination between face-to-face -face and online. It, uh, I've asked this to a couple of different professors that have been in the show since in the year plus that we've been doing the show. If you're going to take a class online um, and you haven't done it before, it, you have to be dedicated to take that because it's basically being self-motivated. It Online courses are hard to take. Uh, there's the myth out there that online courses are easier. They are not easier. They're not easier, in my opinion, from my experience, and I'm not t speaking for all teachers, but... Uh, from the teacher's viewpoint, for me, um, it's actually in many times a lot more work, a lot more because I'm basically individually tutoring a lot of the students, even though uh, are working with all the students instead of having everybody together. Uh, it's really important in an online course for the instructor to answer their emails, stay on top of their emails, and be available for the student. Uh, for a student taking an online course. Um, they need to be very good with their time management. They need to be very good at uh, getting things done and not procrastinating. Um, they need to understand that if they have questions, they need to ask questions. Um, uh, many of my students sometimes are hesitant to ask questions when they first send me an email and, and I do everything I can to try to uh, get them to ask me those questions because you're kind of, kind of on your own um, in online and also since I teach mostly freshmen and sophomore, um, particularly the freshman level courses, I try to send out reminders. Hey, remember you have a test next week. Hey, remember finals are coming up. Hey, you know, withdrawal deadline, those kind of things. Um, so no, an online course, if it's done right, is not a walk in the park. Uh, it's, I did one online course and they were just sort of coming. I was in grad school and they were doing it and it was the hardest course I had to take it was just but most of it was just sort of fighting yourself you That's get the you, hard part you get caught up in life you got family you're taking you a job you're doing all oh, these I'll different things and I'll do and all of a sudden you're like uh oh right. you know and it's and you have to be disciplined to it um, and and a lot of people will take like all online classes and I always tell students you want to get on a campus I imagine for science you really need to get into the classroom that that's a that's a really good point, but there's a 
there are some people who would love to do that, but because of their job mm -hmm. and their work, they can't. For example, um, uh, I have some uh, friends who are uh, firefighters, and they work what's called a 3-4 uh, schedule or yeah. a 2-3 schedule. There is no way that they can come to a regular 16-week class in the classroom unless their job lets them go because uh, they'll work a day, they'll have a day off, work a day, have a day off, work a day, and then they'll have four days off. And, of course, this rotates, so they'll work a few Tuesdays in a row, then they'll be working some Wednesdays. So online courses, even in the science, and I design a lot of online courses, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but some, and I have my students do actual hands-on labs. And we have an environmental science professor, um, uh, Professor Bonnie Schmidt, and she has designed some really amazing outside labs for the environmental science online course. So it's really important if the student is not able to come to campus, which you know a job mm -hmm. like that or an airline pilot uh -huh. or whatever would preclude, um, to be able to build good labs into the course. That's an interesting. That's an interesting uh, perspective. Uh, Joe, you got another call. Barbara and Bill Hampton from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, yeah. We're considering moving to Arizona. Uh, this sounds really perfect for our two sons. Um, where do I go for more info on your courses and degree programs? Uh, I just want to let you know I found this show on the internet, and this is exactly what we were hoping for. This could change our course of the future. Well, from an overall perspective, go to centralaz.edu, take a look at the website, and then for more specifics, for if they're interested in science, Beth, you can guide them in that direction. Yeah, I would agree. Go to the Central Arizona College website. Um, when you call Central Arizona College, let them know that you're interested in the college and the program scholarships available. Uh, they will be very helpful um, in uh, guiding you with uh, what they have. And if yeah, again, if you do have specific specific questions about my courses, um, I would always be happy uh, to take them. And my email and contact information is all listed on the website. And again, my name is Beth Krieger, and the last name is spelled K-R-U-E-G-E-R. -E so it looks like Freddy Krueger, but it's really Krueger. <laughs> that would be a science night experiment. It, it would. It would. Freddy's my uncle. <laughs> we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk with Beth about her experiences of teaching in China. You're listening to, you're listening to CAC Live on KQCK in the Santan Valley. Are you experiencing computer problems? Is your computer running slow, bogged down with viruses and spyware? You need a reliable and knowledgeable, trustworthy computer service company. Contact Computers, Networks, and More, located in Santan Valley. Get your computer or laptop running in top condition by a certified technician with 20-plus years experience and beta tester from Microsoft. Computers, Networks, and More provides repairs and solutions to any computer-related issue, whether it's software, install installation, troubleshooting, updates, or tune-ups. You can trust computers, networks, and more. Contact Jeff Monday through Saturday, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. to schedule an appointment. We can have you up and running quickly, usually within 48 hours. Located in Santan Valley, computers, networks, and more. We're here for you. Contact Jeff at 480-729-8899. That's 480-729-8899. Family pets are such a big part of our lives. That's why Kelly's Critter Clips of Queen Creek and Sun Lakes has been providing pet grooming services for over 10 years. Your dog's comfort is very important to us, so we take the time to treat your pet with care, love, and professional attention it deserves. We welcome any size and breed and feature shampoo and conditioning, styling, flea and tick dips, ear cleaning, nail trimming, and so many other services that will leave your pet looking good and smelling good and feeling great, all at an affordable price. Located in Queen Creek and Sun Lakes, call now for an appointment, 480-655-5066. Kelly's Critter Clips. <coughs> When you visit Hill Family Dentistry in Santan Valley, dentist Dr. Tim Hill provides each patient with personalized, gentle care that you deserve. Our entire team is dedicated to providing you and your family with services that will make you smile. With a full range of general, cosmetic, and specialty dentistry services that will keep you and your family smiling, our commitment to our community is to provide outstanding oral health Hill Family Dentistry is located on 36359 
Gansell Road in Santan Valley, diagonally across from Banner Ironwood Hospital. Evening and weekend appointments available. We accept most insurances and have in-office policies available for non-insured. Contact us today at 480-588-8127. Hill Family Dentistry. Are you ready to start taking control of your future and maximize your earning potential? Central Arizona College has smaller class sizes and personalized attention to help you compete in today's tough job market. CAC now serves Santan Valley and Queen Creek. The CAC Santan Center is located in the shops at Copper Basin on Hunt Highway behind Barrow's Pizza. Stop in and see how taking classes at CAC costs a fraction of a state university and your credits can transfer. So if you want to earn real money, you need to learn real skills at Central Arizona College. Enroll in classes today by calling 480-677-7825 or visit www.centralaz.edu or call 480-677-7825 or visit www.centralaz.edu. Central Arizona College, your college, your way. As a small business owner, you need to make every dollar count. Phone services are the first indication of quality your customers see in your business. Get all the latest features at a great monthly cost that can save you money and project your business as a professional entity. Call Zentris Communications at 1-877-ZENTRIS. That's 1-877-936-8727. That's 1-877-936-8727. Welcome back to CAC Live. Tom D. Camillo, Joe Carrero. We are live in the Santan Valley with Dr. Beth Krieger from Central Arizona College's Aravipa campus. And uh, Beth, we've been talking about uh, the Aravipa campus, your experience of teaching, where you came from. But uh, two, two facets that we want to touch on here in the next half hour is, uh, one, your photography work, and two, your trip to china your semester abroad let's talk about china first and what that experience was like when did that happen and how long were you there um that's a good question that happened in spring 2011 i left uh at the end of january and i came back toward the end of july so i was there almost six months it's an exchange program between central arizona college and northeastern university which is in shenyang china which is where manchuria used to be it's north uh east china um, it's actually by high speed train. It's about, I want to say about a 12 hour journey from Beijing, maybe not, no, four hour journey from Beijing, but regular train, it's like 12 to 14. So it's Northeast China. When I went over there, um, I was, uh, assigned four classes. Um, two classes were for juniors who were English majors. And the sole purpose of the class was to teach them how to write a research paper. One of the other classes was a graduate course, and it was on American culture, which is actually really funny because I would tell them there is no one American culture. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that that was interesting. And then I had another class which had close to 70 students in it from all over the world um, because anybody could take this class. It wasn't just English or linguistics mm-hmm. majors. And that was it, it was called uh, newspaper reading. It was basically a current events class. And uh, that was, I had a lot of fun um, with that class. But the the research paper writing class, uh, the students typically had never really worked in groups. They had never written a research paper. And so in eight weeks, uh, we worked through all this. And they went from being very quiet, not wanting to ask questions. At the beginning, I put a uh, stack of blank paper, little blank papers next to my desk. And we'd, it was a two hour class and we'd always um, break for 10 minutes between, it was just their system. And I would leave the papers there and they could write a question, don't even have to put their name on it. And they could, um, uh, they could uh, uh, write down a question like, you know, what do you teach in the United States or uh, how how do uh, you know how do you how do you find you know somebody to marry or you know, whatever their question was I, it didn't matter I would be happy to answer uh, any question that they had and after a while they didn't do that they just asked me and I would answer those questions at the beginning of every class 
So at any rate, they had never done a lot of group work, and at the end of the class, I had them spend a few minutes writing down what they liked about the class, what they didn't, what they learned, and overwhelmingly, they loved group work, and they had some pretty insightful stuff like, well, my, my group members and I all had differing opinions, but I learned that it's good to listen to them, and we got together and did this, that, or the other thing, and, and I was pretty hard on them um, in terms of my standards, uh, but I was willing to work with them and meet with them as, as much as, as was necessary. And I don't know if that's a norm over there because I got some strange looks from some of the other teachers, but um, <laughs> that's what I chose to do. My current events class was amazing. In fact, I just wrote a letter of recommendation for one of my students in there. She's actually of Turkish descent. She grew up in um, the Xinjiang province, which is basically Uyghurstan and um She's Uyghur, and she wants to go out of China to study public administration. And I just got done writing a letter from her. So I'm in touch with about six or eight of my students and you, friends. You speak there. a lot of languages? I do not. I'm really? embarrassed about that because <laughs> most of my students over there spoke at least two or three. In fact, the student I just told you about, um, she speaks Uyghur, she speaks Russian, she speaks Turkish, she speaks Mandarin, and she taught herself English. And so it's like completely embarrassing wow. that I only speak English. <laughs> 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 and that just seems how it is in the rest of the world. And um, most people know several different languages, and they thought it was odd that I didn't. And I said, yeah, I wish I knew more, too. <laughs> it's funny. I heard Bill Cosby do a routine once, and the reason he said people in other countries can speak li other languages, like in Europe, he goes, he would say, you go an hour in the East Coast, you go from New York to Washington to Philadelphia. He said, over there, you go from Germany to England <laughs> to France to Spain, you got four different languages. <laughs> he said it's a geographic thing more than anything. It was kind of a, a sort of a funny look at, at it. Um, what was the biggest challenge for you to go to China? I mean, obviously, not just culturally, but the government's vastly different than what's over here. And um, were there things you had to worry about when you were teaching over there that you couldn't say or do or... Um, I was careful in some of the things I said or do because I realized I'm a guest in the country mm -hmm. and they treated me incredibly well. They were some of the most gracious hosts and I'd been to China before and I had found the same thing. Um, but I'm a guest in the country. I'm representing Central Arizona College. So, um, and I, you know, I'm that way here too. You know, there are certain things you just, you just don't do particularly as a, as a professor and, I, and I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, so I was careful what I said and, and what I did, um, just to be respectful because I am in a different uh, culture. Um, probably well, one of the biggest challenges um, when I was over there, uh, even though, um, and th this, is, this isn't, this is, I, I'll mention one of the small challenges. I love cheese. <laughs> <laughs> it was so hard to find cheese. And I go to the Carrefour, <laughs> which is a French supermarket, but it's mostly Chinese um, types of items um, but occasionally they'd have that you know really bland Land of Lakes mild cheddar and, I, and I'd like hoard it <laughs> so I could have some and they have Pizza Hut and stuff but it, it's not quite the same but once in a while I go have a cheese pizza um, just because I, I missed it so that, that was minor the hardest thing actually for me was coming back and readjusting into this culture that was, really? that was the hardest for me and I would love to teach in another country again um, would would love to um, have that experience again. I I really even though there were days where yeah I was maybe a little homesick like my dog who's very old was I, we thought she was going to die so I was really homesick and then my mom was sick and then that made me homesick but for the most part I really enjoy being in a totally different culture and different environment and just get thrown in there and see what happens and. I, I, I enjoy that that a lot, and a lot of people I know don't, and that's fine. Everybody's different, but I would love to go to a, to another country and uh, teach again at some point, not right away, but at some point in the f future. It was it was absolutely incredible experience, and I, I miss a lot of the Chinese food now here, so I'm happy to find Mr. <laughs> Lee Lee's supermarket <laughs> so I can go get the stuff that I used to get in China and make my Chinese food now. <laughs> the, Joe, you got a question? Uh, yes, Pre uh, Preston uh, from Trenton, New Jersey, had a comment. He said, I'm a, I'm a former professor at MIT, and based on what I'm seeing, Central Arizona College looks to be an incredible opportunity for students wanting more. I would say that's extremely accurate. Wow. I, I think that's a really 
Thank you very much. I, I want to put that sir. on the website. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's really cool. That's a very, very nice um, comment. If you're ever out here, you'd be more than welcome to come check out any of my classes. <laughs> oh, we're always looking for adjuncts if you retire out this way too, right? <laughs> that's, uh, did, did going to Thank China you. make you a better professor? Oh, absolutely. Uh, everything I do and all my students I have every semester, I think, make me better because the, the, it's for me, it's a constantly evolving process. Um, I was at a conference last week for National uh, Science Teachers Association and a person there, Dr. Tom Lord, who I admire greatly, he's a big name in biology and, and science education. And he said, you know, he says, I feel so bad for the students I had my first couple of years because I just, I didn't know what I know now and I feel like I'm such a better teacher. And I feel like that's a really good comment. You, for me anyway, and I, again, I'm not speaking for all teachers, just myself. Every experience I have makes me a better teacher. I think one of the things that China did for me was even though many of them understand, uh, my, or my students understood English, they have learned from non-native speakers. And so I found myself picking and choosing my words carefully, being careful not to use slang. Like one thing I say to my students here, we'll have, let's say, a lesson on, oh, I don't know, the action potential in a nerve cell. And I'll say, does that make sense? And my students say, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Or no, it doesn't. And my students in China say, okay. makes sense. <laughs> what, what, do you, what does that mean? <laughs> and it, it really gets me thinking about, and I've had graduate courses in linguistics and grammar, and it just really got me thinking more and more about the, I do like to write, I, I am a published author too, um, but it got me thinking more about my word choices, how I would phrase things. Sometimes that was a little tiring, but I think it was a great exercise. And in fact, one of my students um, was visiting uh, here over the Thanksgiving break, and she was able to spend a few days with me. And my niece was here from Colorado State University. And we had done something, and we were all happy, so we said, yeehaw. She looks at me, she says, what is yeehaw? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, great question. She's like, she was really embarrassed to ask. I said, that's a great question. So we thought about it, and I explained what I thought it was. My niece explained. Then we looked it up on, on her Chinese to English translation, then in our dictionary. And I like language. So for me, it was, it was, uh, it, one way it made me a better teacher was, was um, really being careful, even more careful than I had been of the words I use and thinking about them, particularly for students that are uh, English is their second language. It's funny you say that because people will hear me. I'll call and talk to a friend will call from the Philadelphia area or South Jersey area, and I'll go, yo, what's happening? And, and the first time some people out here heard that, they're like, that's really rude. I'm like, oh, I never even thought about it. I said, no, it's, it's not hello. It's like, yo, you know, what's happening? You know, and just how we grew up speak, and it really is. So somebody in China learning the language and you trying to explain how the cultures are so different. I mean, it was different from the city of Philadelphia to the sub to the suburbs to the center of Pennsylvania where the Amish and Pennsylvania Dutch, totally different kind of culture. Yes. So I can imagine somebody from China trying to under, trying to explain that to them. What I did, and actually that's a great segue into the American culture class that I was teaching. Um, I was trying to explain to them, you know, we're, we're one big country, but we're all these different cultures. There are all these different things. You, you know, I could take each of you and put you in a different part of the United States, and we could all come back and talk about our experiences. You think you'd visit a different country. Countries, yeah. China's like that, too. And, you know, the people in the South can't often understand the people in the mm. North. But at any rate, so what I did instead was telling them was I showed them. I took the uh, data from the 2010 census and put and showed it to them on a map you know education poverty you know housing r ethnicity rate all this stuff and they their eyes got huge no wow and then i had them as i was asked him well why do you think there's more people with you know phds and master's degrees here why do you think there's more poverty here and so i used that tool to show them really what the united states was like and it was completely different from their <clears throat> misconceptions and that, that's another good tool I found is that if you, if you do visit other countries, and not just as part of a tour group, but you're really immersed in the culture, um, you really see that a lot of the stuff that governments feed you, no matter what, U.S., China, whatever, about other countries um, is probably not correct. It's better to – that doesn't mean some of it isn't, isn't correct, but I like to form my own opinion and not be – not be told oh, the Chinese or this or that or the other thing. Those and are government views, and it's really about the people. Right, and a lot of my Chinese students 
were really able to make that distinction. It was it was really 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 fascinating, and um, uh, yeah, it was it was a wonderful um, experience. I am so grateful that I had it. We got some calls. We did. We had a we had another one uh, pointed and directed at Dr. Krieger. Is it? Yes, that's great, sir. Uh, Jennifer says uh, Jennifer from Coolidge, now in San Diego, said, "I know Dr. Krieger." And she's a wealth of knowledge in most areas, including life. She's one of uh, those people who will do just about anything once. I like that. Anything <laughs> once. If it will help someone learn. I love her. Oh, well, thank you, Jennifer. Wow, right on. That is really, send me an email. I love hearing from my former students. <laughs> awesome. That, that is really, really nice. Thank you. I'm <laughs> Yeah, I'm blown away. Thank you. <laughs> we get a lot of calls from San Diego, too. Quite a few. We do. We a a few. lot of listeners. So we thank you for listening to CAC Live and KQCK. Let's uh, let's turn a little bit. And, um, Joe, we can start looking at photos? some of the photos here. Uh, uh, Beth is obviously an accomplished photographer. Um, birds are one of the specialties. Trains are another of the specialties. But really, it's a sort of this whole gamut of different photos. And um, as as uh, Joe kind of gets in, gets set up, the um, when did you start shooting photography? Were you were you like a child that you picked up a camera, or was it something that came later in life? No, it came it came later. And um, I would disagree with you on one point. I wouldn't call myself an accomplished photographer. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just something that I really uh, enjoy doing, and I, I like to try to capture. Uh, the feel of a place and how a place is and and what I get from place and it's interesting in High Country News which is uh, a magazine of the West they just had their book issue uh, this fall and their theme was place which is interesting because West is a Western mm. US there's a big amount of um, constructs around what that place is to different people and different cultures and so forth so I try to do that from my perspective um, so if, if we just take a minute and look at, at some of my photos, um, I, I can tell you what they are and where they are. This is me. Um, not such a great subject, but uh, it's, <laughs> this is in China, though, isn't this it? This is in China. And uh, for my my courses that I do online, I like to put a picture of me up for my students so that they know who is this, you know, emailing person. Um, this is me hiking. I love to hike. I love to hike. And the, those are the Catalina Mountains behind me. And this is Honeybee Canyon, uh, which is a place in Tucson. And I lead um, some Sierra Club hikes in Honeybee Canyon where we're, we're doing birds or plants or those types of things. When you lead the hikes, how does that all work? Do people just go through the Sierra Club or the different organizations? Anybody, anybody can go. Yeah. There's a, uh, Usually they're listed as Sierra Club um, uh, hikes, but and anybody can go and if if they're interested. Just contact me. And great. there's a small, there's like a one dollar donation which goes to uh, the Sierra Club. So. Okay. Joe's got dogs barking, but I think yeah. it's like oh, there we go, right there. This is um, this is this, actually I'd like to spend a minute talking about this picture if I can. Um, first of all, this was taken in West B. That is the great oh. elevator in West B. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'm actually in North Dakota, and those grain elevators are in Montana. Oh, oh and wow. The, and the Saskatchewan to the right? <laughs> uh, Saskatchewan would be up to the north, north. so beyond the grain, about 10 miles. And actually, our school was so small that we used to partner with another school in Granora, North Dakota, so we could have sports teams because um, we were so small. <laughs> eight, eight man football? Yeah, well, we didn't have football, <laughs> oh, didn't have football. but we had basketball and volleyball <clears throat> and, and those kind of things. And we were able to do that, a, a two state partnership. And I think we did no. mostly, like for some sports, we played in Montana and some we did North. It was, it was interesting. But at any rate, this is my dog. Uh, her name is Shady Lady. She's a shaded cream. That's why she got her name. Uh, she's a long haired miniature dachshund. She's 16 and a half years old now. Wow. And very high maintenance, <laughs> just because she's old. She has she's she was a very low maintenance dog. She used to hike with me. People are like, oh, you need a big dog to hike. It's like, no, she can you know hike the butt off any any German Shepherd I've ever been around. So this the other thing about this is this is a photography trick that a lot of people do with rattlesnakes. They'll hold a rattlesnake up in front of them, and because of the perspective and whatnot with the camera, it makes the snake look huge, like it's as tall as you, whereas in reality it's probably only two or three feet long. 
This here is a good example of that in its extreme, as I've put her up and put her in the foreground in front of the grain elevators. So I call this giant dachshund eats grain <laughs> elevators. And so whenever my friends send me those ridiculous rattlesnake pictures, um, I always send them this and said, yeah, check out, check this out. There's a giant dachshund in Westby and it ate grain elevators. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm watching a Godzilla movie. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a, that's a trick that... Um, a lot of people will you know, see this big rattlesnake if they, it's being held out in front of You've them. You've seen the 220-pounder from Texas? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, this this is a, this dachshund's in Montana, not Texas. And he weighs 1,000 pounds, right? Uh, 1,500. <laughs> <laughs> She's actually seven and a half. <laughs> this is one of my most favorite places in Arizona. I love Oregon Pipe Cactus National wow. Monument, and that's an Oregon Pipe Cactus. That's up I, on the way to um, Mexico, isn't it? Yeah, on the way down to... Uh, Rocky Point? Yeah, Port of Penasco, Rocky Point. Um, lots of people, oh, aren't you scared? Blah, 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 you know, all the drug stuff. Well, they don't want to run into me anymore, and I want to run into them. And parts of the park where the activity has been the worst are closed. You can't even go there. And so the parts of the park that, that you do go in, um, there's a lot of people like myself or hikers, campers, whatever. You cannot do backcountry camping here anymore. Uh, it's a wonderful park. I would highly recommend it. Um, Don't pick up hitchhikers. Yeah, just the, the, the usual. I lived in Laredo, Texas. I worked for Laredo Community College. I was the director of distance learning, and that was a very dangerous place to live. But you just learn to take proper precautions. And I met a lot of very good people in Laredo. In fact, I still have a good friend there. This is, excuse me, this is Oregon Pipe Cactus again. And the yellow flowers are brittle bush. This is in the spring. And it's absolutely beautiful there in March, April, when the wildflowers come out. I would so recommend um, people going down here and checking it out. And I, and I love the Oregon pipe cactus. So this is the northern end of their range of the or Oregon pipe. They do not like uh, cold weather. What do we got up next? Sorry, here? I got a little slow there. So oh, no, that. that's fine. This is another uh, picture taken in Oregon <clears throat> pipe, and you see the flowers, the poppies, and, oh, gosh, I can't. Wildflowers, I always have to refresh my memory every year because they're only around for about a month, and then if you don't use it, you lose it. So <laughs> I forget what the blue ones are called. I'm, I'm sure there are people out there that know. Um, I just need to refresh my memory on them. Uh, this is another wow. area. Uh, I love to travel and, and camp. And wow. um, I used to have a truck, but I got tired of um, paying for the gas company CEO's fifth uh, houses and fourth cars. <laughs> so I traded it in, and I now have a Geo, or I, not a Geo. I used to have a Geo. It was 15 years old. <laughs> but I have a uh, Toyota Prius, and I love it. In fact, I got almost 60 miles to the gallon on the way up here today. Wow. What, do you, what do you shoot with, a Canon? I, I do have a Canon. Yeah, I have a Canon Digital Rebel. And that's nice. what I shoot with. And this, uh, I traveled up here to the Painted Desert, uh, which is very, very beautiful. Mm. I would love to go backpacking out there. You've got to carry all your water. Obviously, there's no water there. Um, I, I've done the Grand Canyon. This is the Badlands, um, which are in Petrified oh. Forest up around, um, is it Holbrook? The, is that the correct name of the town? Uh, it's near Winslow. But at any rate, it's That would the, be Holbrook. Yeah, Holbrook. I thought it was Holbrook, so... But I love to love to travel and camp. Uh, this is my dog. She's too old to hike, so I carry her. <laughs> I'm the mule. <laughs> and this was the last hike of the year. This is organ pipe again. Uh, you can see a turkey vulture. They're amazing birds uh, soaring around. They up clean there. up everything. They do. They do. The desert would be very stinky if it weren't for them. <laughs> so, but they're an amazing bird. Uh, here's another, this is, I'm sorry, it's not the best resolution. I, I had a smaller resolution so I could email it. This is just another organ pipe cactus. And you can see sometimes they send their columns out all over the place. Well, I know why that, that I see the UFO in the background on that one. <laughs> yeah, this and, uh, is really in Roswell. Or is that, or is that, or is that Bigfoot? <laughs> oh, well, there's, there is a Bigfoot hiding there, but I, you know, only a few people. I see, see the arm that. swing, yeah. Yeah. I see that. That little yeah. white blotch is the Yeti up in the right corner, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this uh, is a Gila wood pe this is again a, not a good picture if you want to see the detail of the bird but I was trying to do a silhouette and you can tell it's a Gila woodpecker I love the Gila woodpeckers they always make me laugh and he's getting into my hummingbird feeder which is which is fine I love that picture and that's uh, it that's... so I don't didn't bring any trains I'm sorry I grabbed the wrong uh, jump drive oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, that's great. We actually have about a minute left. And again, um, Beth, we appreciate you taking a drive. It's about 100 miles, roughly. 100 miles? It's. I live down in Oro Valley, right near Catalina State Park. So she made the long drive up here. I think it's here. 75 70, to 100, 100 miles, something like that. that it's a long ways. <laughs> and and uh, it, we, we really appreciate you coming, all the fascinating work that you're doing. We'd love to have you come back sometime maybe with some students after one that of your – That would be awesome. Uh, you know, after one of the – your some field work to get them or some students that have gone on uh to you know into the working world or onto the universities that would love to join us um and uh, we can arrange it i'd love to have some i've seen some pictures of your of you that you've sent to me on with students out in the field working which would be great to bring that that in to really let people know kind of you know here's what the opportunities are out there our Viper campus is really kind of a playground for science. It's wonderful, and I'd love to have the students. And I'm very grateful to have you guys um, have me here today, so thank you. But, yeah, yeah I would love to showcase the students. <clears throat> They're much more important than I am. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to thank Dr. Beth Krieger for joining us today. The video will be up later on YouTube. You'll be able to check it out. Uh, for Joe Carrero, I'm Tom DiCamillo. Thanks for listening to CAC Live. We'll be back next Thursday. And we actually have one of two guests because we're not sure which one's going to be able to make it next week. But one will obviously involve trains. The other one will involve basketball. So either one, <laughs> it's uh, it's going to be fun. For Joe Carrero and Dr. Beth Krieger, I'm Tom DiCamillo. Thanks for listening to CAC Live on KQCK in the Santan Valley. Got termites gnawing on your house? Do you have a pest problem in or around your home or your business? At Lights Out Exterminating, we provide either the solution or preventative measure to take care of your pest problems that stem from ants, crickets, cockroaches, spiders, and scorpions. Lights Out Exterminating provides superior pest and termite control at affordable prices for a wide array of desert pests. Scorpion control can be difficult. At Lights Out Exterminating, their service is based off right products at the right time. Find out how much more effective scorpion control can be when you turn the lights out. Don't hesitate. Lights out exterminate.